and we know you have the bill. We have the right diet. Lift your hands if you are ready. Put your hands together with joy. Let's receive our Papa, Dr. Abel Damina. Glory. Good morning, everybody. Have you greeted somebody this morning? Have you made somebody happy this morning? Are you excited this morning about the goodness of Jesus? Greet somebody this morning. Make sure somebody is happy this morning. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Oh, glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this another opportunity this morning to come before your holy, precious reading word. Thank you that the mighty Holy Spirit lives on our inside. So this morning we come humbly and respectfully to receive the engrafted word which is able to save our souls. Your word comes with clarity. Your people built up, equipped, edified, and Jesus is glorified. So we rejoice that by the end of this session, we'll all be the better for it. In Jesus' name we pray and every believer says a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Let's release our faith together. As we say these words, I am born of God. I am born of the word. The word of God is my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore today, I will understand the word of his grace. I will be built up. By the end of this service, I will never be the same. Never ever be the same again. In Jesus' name. And every believer says a powerful amen. amen. What a day to be alive, man. Let's celebrate our fellowship together with one another this morning. Glory. Turn to two people by you. Tell them you will be blessed because I came this morning. And you will be blessed because I'm standing by you or sitting by you, whichever one. Oh, glory, 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 hallelujah. Amen. Grab your pen, your notebook, your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self this morning. We want to welcome everybody connected to this service by way of Kingdom Life Network. Those of you connected by way of, of, of radio in Aquaibom State, we're so glad to welcome every one of you to the service this morning. And I want to especially welcome the social media community, our brothers and sisters online. What a joy to have all of you connected this morning, wherever you're watching around the world. Do me the favor of dropping the links wherever you can drop it let's get the word to the ends of the earth you can also subscribe to our youtube channel it's abel damina ministries international like the video and engage in the course of the service all of you also that are watching at facebook help us share the links drop them wherever you can let's get this word to the ends of the earth and i'm so excited about this morning school of ministry we're just going to continue examining the concepts we've been looking at I also want to welcome all the citizens around the world that are connected real time. We love you. We're glad that we're together serving Christ and fulfilling the mandate of God in our world. Can somebody shout a powerful amen? All right. We've been looking at the concept of full-time ministry, full-time ministry, what it is, what it entails, and what it means. And we've already been able to define from that word full-time ministry that it's not a Bible word, it's an English word. And we've been able to look at the word full-time from the Cambridge Dictionary Online that the word full-time is an adjective in relation to full-time job or activity. And then we saw that that word full-time is an activity that uses a lot of your time. An activity that uses a lot of your time. Then we saw the word ministry, which is a noun. The word ministry means to work as a church minister, to work as a church minister or a religious worker. So looking at the meanings we've been able to put forth in the dictionary, full-time ministry therefore will imply devoting one's full attention and energies to something. Devoting one's full attention and energies to something, which will actually be a requirement of all or a large amount of your time to the office, 
to the duties or work as a religious minister. So from what we have seen so far, full-time ministry, therefore, will mean commitment, devotion that requires a large amount of one's time. Commitment, a devotion that requires a lot of one's time to the work of ministry. And we said this work of ministry is also what we call discipleship. Discipleship within the Holy Scriptures. And we've taken time to lay quite some work. We've done quite some exegesis and we'll just continue from where we stopped last night. And we began to see last night that there were others apart from Brother Paul who were gainfully employed while doing the work of ministry. And we began to establish all of that. And I just want to read, you know, a scripture as we continue this journey this morning. So this morning, I want to start by answering, did Brother Paul instruct believers as regards being in an occupation or career? Did he instruct believers as it regards being in an occupation or career? Let's look at it from the scripture. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 from verse 6. Second Thessalonians chapter 3 from verse 6 and pj you read to verse 15 let's go now we command you brethren in the name of our lord jesus christ that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us next verse for yourselves know how ye ought to follow us for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you next verse Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Please pay attention to those apostolic words, because this is Brother Paul talking about his own life and other apostles that were with him. He said, we've not eaten anybody's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Next verse. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. Next verse. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Next verse. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. Next verse. Now them that are such, we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. That word command, if your Bible was mine, I will take note of that word command. Next verse. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Next verse. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. Next verse. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. So firstly, Brother Paul employed the use of the word command, which was translated from the Greek word stelo, S-T-E-L-L-O, stelo, which implies to be cautioned, to beware or to stay away. To be cautioned, to beware or to stay away. And the tone of that word command implies that the recipient of the command is not at liberty to analyze the reasons to obey or not the word command that is his or hers is to obey so this command is in view of who not to talk to who not to talk to and that's why this word is more of a preservative word the word command okay it is was also used by brother paul in second corinthians chapter 8 verse 20 second corinthians Chapter 8, verse number 20. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us. So the word command means to avoid. We command you to stay away from anyone who walks disorderly among you. Who does not have a job, but is just a busy body. He doesn't have a job. He carries briefcase everywhere. I am an itinerant minister. I am called by God. And always writing letters of appeal for financial assistance. Always begging. Just a busybody. No job. Bible say, uh, the, the apostles say, avoid. Stay away from such a person. He didn't say that is, keep him close. He says, avoid him. So somebody you avoid is not somebody you give your money to. 
Don't be sentimental. Don't say he's a man of God or he's a man of God. Let's no. Avoid him. He's a bad testimony of the gospel. Avoid him. Let him know something is terribly wrong with him. Stay away from him. Don't support him. Don't give him. Don't support his ministry because there's no ministry he's doing. He's only carried briefcase all over the place. Am I communicating at all? These are apostolic instructions from God's word. And that's why I'm teaching. Because we need to know where to put our money and where not to put our money because the money is not too much. In the midst of scarce resources, you must know exactly what cost to support and what cost not to support so you're not sentimental and be thinking, maybe if I didn't do it, the Lord will not be happy. Not for a busybody who is not working, he's strong, everything is okay with him, He's just all over the place. And you cannot establish your finger on one impact he's making anywhere. Am I communicating at all? Now, so he says avoid. That is beware of someone and ensure that they have no impact on one's life. Avoid them. Now, there's a word there, brother Paul, used the word tradition. Tradition. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6, read for me. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. That word trans tradition was translated from the Greek word paradosis. Paradosis. P-A-R-A-D-O-S-I-S. -A paradosis. Which implies something that is handed over to another. The tradition. Paradosis something that is handed over to another it can also imply something handed over from generation to generation and it is not a universal practice it is something handed over to a specific people a specific people from generation to generation just like when you call something a culture so that's what paul meant by tradition it was used in Matthew 15, verse 2 and 3, PJ. Matthew 15, verse number 2 and verse number 3. Matthew 15, 2 and 3. Who is on the computer this morning? Matthew 15, verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Next verse. For God commanded, saying... But he answered and said unto them, Why do ye also transgress the commandments of God by your tradition? Give me verse 6. Verse 6. And honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. You have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. All right, take note of that. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse number 3. Matthew chapter 7 verse number 3 and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye next verse did i say matthew sorry mark chapter 7 verse 3 i was wondering where you're reading from mark chapter 7 verse 3 that's right for the pharisees and all the jews except they wash their hands oft eat not holding the tradition of the elders holding the tradition of the elders and if you read up to verse 13 you'll keep seeing the use of that word tradition the tradition of the elders that is the culture the elders handed over to the believer the culture the elders handed over to the believer look at galatians chapter 1 verse 14 galatians Chapter 1, verse number 14. And profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Of the traditions of my fathers. Look at the way Brother Paul kept using that word. Again, in Colossians 2, 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse number 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Again, the word tradition stands out there. Then look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. Hold fast to the traditions which you have been taught. 
whether by word or our epistles. This implies they can be taught and traditions can be communicated via words. They can be taught and they can be communicated via words. So Paul is speaking of apostolic traditions which are to be obeyed by the believer. Apostolic traditions. Furthermore, brother Paul highlights the importance of industry. That means Paul taught them to have value for industry. Have value for industry. Have value for work. That means in Thessalonica, they valued people giving to work. They valued people earning money and earning resources by themselves. Which means that ministry is not an excuse to be jobless. Ministry is not an excuse to abandon your secular and natural responsibilities just because God called you. No. You've got to get a job, get a business, get an investment. And while you are doing that, you are doing ministry. Look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse number 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any should not work, neither should he eat. If any should not work, neither should he eat. This was what Paul had explained to the elders in Ephesus. In Acts 20, 34, where we read yesterday, put it up for me. Acts chapter 20, verse 34. Acts of the Apostles 20, 34. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I've coveted no one silver or gold, but these hands have ministered is an example of a minister, an apostle of repute, one who was dedicated to establishing doctrinal framework for the church, busy pastoring churches and raising sons in ministry, and at the same time engage, engaging gainfully in industry, making money and supporting ministry. That's an example. And Brother Paul further exemplified this in instructing Timothy concerning widows. Look at First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now he's talking about widows, but then he's speaking about widows and he gives certain qualifications. Look at that First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 again. First Timothy 5, 8. Read for me. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. He speaks of the one who does not provide for his own. That he has denied the faith. That term, the faith, in this text implies the teaching. He has denied the teaching on being involved in an occupation. He has denied the teaching, the tradition of being gainfully employed. He has denied the faith. He has denied the teaching that came that you have to walk to eat. He has denied that teaching, which implies he has denied sound teaching, which means sound Bible teaching will teach believers to work for an income. Sound doctrine will get believers to get a job and make livelihood from our jobs. Then brother Paul also instructed believers on honest living. Honest living. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 28. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 28, PJ. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. He says, let him that stole steal no more. Let him walk with his hand that which is good. That he may have that honesty. So the letters of Paul taught not notably believers on honest living. Now, Paul recognizes the role of what can be termed work ethics and regard for the masters of labor, employers of labor. He severally mentions the believer's submission in instances where he or she is in the employment of another. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 and 9. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 5 
and nine. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto Christ. As unto Christ. So in the office where you're walking, walk as if you're walking unto Christ. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons. With also, him. masters who have people working under you, treat them properly, pay them well, pay them on time, treat them well, because you also have a master in heaven whom you're learning how to deal with people from. So he speaks both to those that are working and those that employ people that are working. Because industry is very, very loud in the epistles. That's why when people say God prospers people, I just laugh. They are unschooled. If God were to prosper people, the apostles will not be loud on walk. Walk, walk. He that does not walk should not eat. Get a job. Why will Paul say my hands have provided my necessities? Why didn't Paul wait for God to give him money? Why didn't Paul wait? Because there is dignity in labor. And the word of God is loud on it. God wants us to be responsible citizens, responsible people in the society, and at the same time, preach the gospel. There's nothing as beautiful as having a job, having a business, having your own source of income, and at the same time, able to serve God's purpose to your world. Are we teaching good this morning? Please, this is very important. Now, what was profound in the apostles' letters is the fact that the minister of the gospel must never be found serving in ministry for material benefit. That's very profound. The minister of the gospel must never be found serving in ministry for material benefits. The epistles were very loud on this. However, they were to be given to an occupation. The apostles of Jesus seem to be discreet as regards material support for ministers of the gospel. In fact, almost seeming like a forbidding in their letters. Giving to men of God is almost like a bidding. They were very discreet as to how they even talked about it. They almost treated it like, you know, a, a, a no-go area. Instead, they seemed to amplify the minister being careful for materialism and what his motives in ministry ought to be. You know, there's a ministry, a global ministry in America where the man of God is sound, sound doctrine preacher. And his ministry, because of his too many schedules, bought him a private jet. But till he died, nobody knew he had a private jet. <laughs> nobody knew he had a private jet. Nobody knew it. So, a friend of mine was asking his son, in me, his son, biological son, why didn't your father allow people to know that he had a private jet that was bought for him by the ministry? He said his father said to him, the people who bought this jet, some of them cannot afford rent. They sacrifice to buy. There's no need to flaunt it in their faces. There's no need to be flaunting it in their faces. After they have struggled, sweated, out of their hard-earned money, made the money available. He said it is only respectful to keep it out of view and use it when necessary for the purpose for which it was bought. It was not bought for showmanship. It was bought for work. Are we hearing here? The apostles were discreet. It's not this ministry we have today where men of God will raise the money from you and come back and tell you, I have bought houses for my children. I have bought houses for my grandchildren. They will never be poor. They will never beg. But if you want to operate like me, bring again. Only. I have, all my children have houses. My grandchildren have houses. I have put them on different, different programs. They can never be poor. And if you want to function like me, you've got to sow. Don't mind the pain. Because where there's no pain, there's no get thief. Somebody should stand up in that audience and shout, thief. It will happen. Oh. Watch, watch. 
a pastor will be beaten on the pulpit for asking for more. Watch. In this country, just watch. You don't know what is happening. You don't know what is coming up. People are angry because they have been robbed in broad daylight. And they are using the money to oppress them, to taunt them. I've built houses for all my... Is this something to talk about? And in that audience, there are people that are squatting. People squatting. There are people that are struggling to eat. And you are flaunting the houses you built for your children. The ones you have built for their, your grandchildren with their money. You build schools that members' children cannot attend. But you raise money from members to build that school. Oppression. What is different between that and slave trade? What's the difference? You raise money, you raise money, and you told them we want to build a school so our children can have a school to attend, a school to attend. You raised their money and they all contributed. You built the school and put the school fees where their children cannot attend. What is, is that not Yahoo? Wait, talk, is that not Yahoo? It's Yahoo, Yahoo. It's not even Yahoo. It's Yahoo, Yahoo, Yahoo. Are we teaching here? <laughs> Let's look at Peter the Apostle. The same tone brother Peter used in chastising Simon the sorcerer when he offered Peter money. Look at Acts 8.21. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse number 21. Acts 8.21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Your heart is not right. He's talking to Simon Magus. The sorcerer. Look at that verse. I mean, later on, Peter speaking in 1 Peter 5 2. Look at the way Brother Peter will speak on this matter. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. 1 Peter 5 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. The word constraint, not by constraint. The word constraint was translated from the Greek word. Anakastos, Anakastos, A N A G K A S T O S, A N A G K A S T O S, which means it has to be done. The flock of God taking oversight, not by that which has to be done, that is not of necessity. Then the word willingly willingly was translated from the greek word he calls he calls h-e-k-o-u-s-i-o-s h-e-k-o-u-s-i-o-s which implies to be willful voluntary or willing it further carries the sense of choice willingly a sense of choice there's another word there the word filthy looker filthy looker not for filthy looker do ministry not for filthy looker do ministry not compulsory do ministry willingly and don't do it for material gain ministry is not a meal ticket i said that last night Ministry is not an employment. Ministry is not an employment where you rely on for income. Not for filthy lucre. It relates to money. It was translated from the Greek word. I won't pronounce this one. Man, so I can have my tongue for evening service. A-I-S C-H-R-O K E I D O S. As crocados. It was used once as an adverb. It has a synonym in as crocades. A I S C H R O K E D E S. That's a synonym of that word. Used by Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 8, filthy Luca. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse number 8, PJ. 
Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Look at Titus 1, 7. These guys were very loud on these things. Titus chapter 1, verse number 7. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. He must not be given to filthy lucre. Peter said it. Paul said it. Now, Todd John 1, 7. Todd John chapter 1, verse number 7. Todd John 1, 7. Because that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. They went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles for his name's sake. They went forth taking nothing. So far, it can be said that it is clear that Peter and Paul detached preaching the gospel from a pervading mentality where a minister is seen to be in the paid employment of the church. Peter and Paul, they detach the minister from that. From their teachings here. Where a preacher is detached, detached completely from being paid as an employment of the church for services rendered. And in this case, the services will be the preaching of the gospel or charging a fee for his service. A preacher should not charge for a fee for his service. I remember back in the days you invite some preachers, they will negotiate how much you want to give. Some preachers will say, send me the bank statement of your church and your own personal bank statement. They didn't tell me this. I was sitting there where the preacher was saying it. I want to see the balance on your account and the balance on your church account to see if you can host me. I was sitting there. And then after he sees the balance, how much are you planning to give me? In fact, there are preachers who asked me to send the offering ahead before they will come. And the worst of it is music ministers. The ones they call music ministers. The ones they call, because I didn't see that in the Bible. The ones they call music ministers. There's no difference between them and Davido and Tiwa Savage and Bonaboy. The modus operandi is the same. They have agents, they have agencies, they have managers, they have a list of things you must do, you pay, you sort things out, before they come. The same thing. The only difference is that their lyrics are motivational. Everything that double, double, oh, is motivational. It's not the gospel. It's not the gospel. The gospel must have the facts in it. Any song that doesn't have those facts is not the gospel. It's motivation. The gospel is how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day. That is the gospel. If those lines are not in a song, it is motivation. It is motivation. So they will come and motivate, hide people, make people cry, make people feel nice. And then after it all, nothing. And they will charge $50,000 for one night. $50,000 for one night. Those of them they call A-list in gospel ministers. They will charge that kind of amount. 10 million to my account before we move. One night. These are businessmen using the Bible as a meal ticket. And they don't stay in teaching services. And they don't have pastors. They don't have a pastor. They don't sit down to be taught. They are just like prostitutes. 
When they come and sing, immediately they finish singing, they are gone. Because as far as they are concerned, they are the bosses. The rest of you plus your preachers, you are apprentices. They are stars. Superstars. I don't blame them. It is the churches that patronize them that have given him that given them that relevance. There's a ministry in this country that was responsible for fertilizing, nurturing, and creating that monster. And now that ministry is regretting and they are looking for how to fight it, but the monster has matured. The monster has matured. They don't know how to destroy it. And they have tried to destroy it and some of them have left those churches because they have already established their business. If you don't patronize me, other churches will patronize me. You have told the world that I am a profound, anointed, appointed, ordained man of God that has been so anointed to function with gumption. You can't take it from me. They are trying to fight it. It is not working. You built, you created the elephant. Deal with it. I'm teaching here. If we don't get it right, it will keep going wrong. So you can see the way brother Paul and all the apostles were. We're, we're. we're very serious about these issues. Peter stands, you know, Peter stands seems very sharp and focuses on the motive of ministers. He's dealing with motive. His stance seems to support ministers' occupation being distinct. Being distinct. Don't forget Exodus 18. One of the ways the elders were, of the people were chosen and separated apart from the people was that they will not be covetous. In Exodus 18, choose people that will not be covetous. They will not do it for money. That's what Moses did in Israel in Exodus 18. And that's where we get the template for leadership in the church of God. And this tone seems sustainable in Peter's second epistle. Look at the way Peter will put it. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 14 to 16. 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 14 to 16. Let's go. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children. Next verse. Covetous practices. They have a heart. They have exercised with covetous practices. Then he said, these are cursed children. When a man's heart is used to greed and covetousness, he said, that, that man is a cursed child. It's not a well-raised child. It's a child of sorrow. Cursed children. Verse 15. Verse 15. Which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. He loved the wages of unrighteousness. Verse 16. But was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb are speaking with man's voice, forbade the madness of the prophets. Peter. <laughs> the madness of the prophet. The dumb are. Speaking, forbid the madness of the prophet. This is serious. Peter warns concerning Balaam when he spoke of covetous practices. In verse 14 where we read, and then he related Balaam with verse 16, that he was doing it for gain. We don't do ministry for gain. We don't do it for gain. And, the, you know, when, when, when Peter was speaking, it was in reference to the story of Balaam. Let's look at that story from where Peter was quoting. Numbers 22, verse 4 and 5. Numbers 22, verse number 4 and verse number 5. 
And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. Verse 5. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beor to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out from Egypt. Behold, they covered the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Balak's intention is captured in verse 6. So let's read verse 6. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou cursest is cursed. The elders of Moab came to him with rewards of divination. That is payment for his services. Look at verse 7. Same scripture, Numbers 22, 7. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came unto Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balaam. He was spoken to concerning the men and their intentions. Then look at verse 9 to 11 of that same chapter. Verse 9 to 11. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? 10. And Balaam said unto God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, had sent unto me, saying, 11. Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse me them. Peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. Now, the instructions given were very clear. Look at verse 12. Verse 12. Verse 12. And God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. Now, initially, Balaam obeyed. Look at verse 13. He obeyed initially. And Balaam rose up in the morning and said unto the princes of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refused to give me leave to go with you. Now, Balak's offer was increased. Balak increased. The, he raised the volume. Verse 15 to 18. <laughs> Verse 15 to 18. And Balak sent yet again princes more and more honorable than they. Next verse. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus said Balak the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me. Next verse. For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. Next verse. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God to do less or more. Even if you fill the house with silver and gold, I will not do it. Okay? Do Balaam seem not to consider the second offer? <laughs> but what he did next reflects his mind. Look at verse 19 and to 21. Verse 19 to 21. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. <laughs> Eh? <laughs> Let me think about it. Wow. Next verse. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. 21. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. The man is gone. Now look at the consequence of disobedience to the Lord. Verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary up against him. Now he was riding upon his ass and his two servants were with him. His response after. Verse 34 and 35. His response after. 34, 35. Numbers 22. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displeased thee, I will get me back again. 35. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that shalt thou speak. So Balaam went with the princes of Balak. 36. And when Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto a city of Moab which is in the border of Arnon, which is in the utmost coast. 37. 
And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? 38. And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God put in my mouth, that shall I speak. 39. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came into Kirja, who thought? 40. And Balak offered oxen and sheep and sent to Balaam and to the princes that were with him. 41. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up into the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the utmost part of the people. Now, later on, he counseled Balak on what to do to erode the ways of the children of Israel from serving God. Later on, look at Numbers 31, 16. Numbers 31, verse 16. Behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. So now the example of Balaam in the epistles is covetousness. That's why it's always called the doctrine of Balaam. Because this is how the doctrine of Balaam operates. Where you negotiate prize for spiritual service. That's the doctrine of Balaam. Okay? Now, Jude speaks of this example of Balaam in Jude 1, 11 and 12. Jude chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain and run greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Kor. Error of Balaam for reward. Ministry for reward. Give me verse 12. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the root. He itemizes greed and reward as the focus. Greed and reward. So Balaam's example in the epistles is one of greed and gain. Anytime they say Balaam in the epistles, what they are talking about is greed and gain, which the minister will avoid by getting a job. The minister will avoid greed and looking for gain by getting a job. Simple. Get a job. Get a business. Be employed. Invest. Start something that makes income for you and your family. Once you and your family are taken care of, basically, you're okay. You're okay. Then you can preach without the coloration of greed. You can preach without the coloration of how you can make some little money. You can say the kind of things I say with your eyes clear and shake your head the way I shake it. Because you're not looking for how afterward to say Something for the boys. You can speak with audacity. The fathers and all the material, prosperity, Pentecostal pastors teamed up and ganged up against me across Africa. Don't invite Damina. Let him be drained. Let's see how he will preach that nonsense. They shut all their doors and thought I would become broke and poor and I would just be begging. And I guess. Now they are confused. Now they are confused. Because first of all, I don't even need their churches. I don't need anybody's pulpit. I can't even service power city enough. True or false? How many campuses can I visit? How many? Even if I'm going to preach in, in the campuses of Power City one day every day of the year, I don't have the time enough. So, who cares? Carry your pulpit. Eat your pulpit. They say my church is empty. Behold the ghosts. They say I'm just a social media noisemaker. Eh, no wahala. No be social media. Uh, if it's just noise, why are all of you reacting? Since it's noise now, do you react to noise? You are now doing videos. 
You can hardly preach in your churches without calling Damina. Damina, God punish you. A man of God is preaching. He stopped. Damina, God punish you. <laughs> and they say he's a social media noisemaker. But he has entered their church. They can't preach without calling his name. And they say he's a social media noisemaker. This noise must be qualitative noise. Who cares? Who want your, I don't want your pulpit. Is this not a pulpit? Is this not a pulpit? It's a pulpit. If it's London, I want to go. Pastor Fola, can I come? Sharp, sharp. If it's America, Pastor Jessica was waiting. <laughs> If it's Lagos, Pastor Gospel. Huh? If it's any side of the United Kingdom, Europe, anywhere. What of Ghana? Cameroon? Abuja? Eh? Togo? Abba? Joss? Eh? Canada? Jamaica? Trinidad and Tobago? India? Eh? Cameroon? Brazil, Guagualada, <laughs> Makodi, Dubai, Doha, even Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, in anywhere. All I need to do is just say, Russia, I'm coming. Put the flyer. Aquingy. They are ganging up. They are tired of it because they have seen that is of no relevance. Do it right. Do it right. You may not be popular, but you will be in the blessing of God. Do it right. You may not be popular. But you will be in the blessing of God. More so when you are doing it right, you will be popular. You will be popular. <laughs> praise God. I say praise God. So greed and reward are the focus. Which the minister will avoid by being gainfully employed. Brother John captures this similarly in Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. Revelation chapter 2 verse 14. Read for me. Revelation 2 14. But I have a few things against thee because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. The doctrine of Balaam. See that? So there's a doctrine called the doctrine of Balaam. That's why we went to read this, how that doctrine functions from where it originated from. John warns about the doctrine of Balaam. That is doing things for material benefit. And that's why the epistles were loud on merchandising the message for material gains. Which implies that for the minister in starting a work, you must not see ministry as starting a business. Anytime you're starting a work for the gospel, see yourself as a volunteer. A volunteer who is simply privileged by God to collaborate with God in bringing the salvation plan of God to mankind. Simple. Simple. And God has so blessed us. Our campus leaders all over this place and all over the world and those that are not here. Everyone is gainfully employed and everybody is using their money to serve the purpose of God. They are all using their money to serve the purpose of God. I'm using my own money too to serve the purpose of God. So all of us are just pushing the walk. Why wouldn't the walk be flying? Every one of us. It's not about what we will eat. It's about how to push the walk. How to push the walk. No pressure. Is there any pressure? No tension. Nobody under any pressure. No pressure. 
We are not asking you to go and, 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 and get a big hall. No, start anywhere. No pressure. And the work is just going. And the gospel is just advancing. Because that's the way the Lord designed that ministry should run. That's the way the Lord designed that ministry should run. So, it's critical to know that everyone that is privileged to preach the gospel and oversee God's people is a volunteer. The work of ministry is sacrificial living, not a paid employment. The work of ministry is sacrificial living, not a paid employment. I'm so grateful to God that early enough in this church, I rejected the idea of salary. Because that then helped me to look out to other sources of income than just salary from this church. I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. So when I was done with the materialistic gospel, I just made up my mind to focus on my investments. Just do my investments, keep doing my investments. Enhance my investments, do my businesses, and have my own income. And God began to bless me with ideas and things that brought monies for me. Brought monies for me. And are still bringing monies for me. God blessed me. Because he saw my heart. I didn't like that thing. I was done with it. I was done, done, done. Done with it. Is a torturous ministry. Thinking of how to collect money from people can kill you as a young boy. It's high blood pressure. Calculating how you will whine people. Whine people. Smile when you don't want to smile. Preach and dance. Even though there's no dancing in the preaching. Run on the pulpit when you shouldn't run. Because you are trying to convince people to bring out hundred, hundred thousand. I came for 14 of you. If you are less than 14, the rest have missed God and God has missed you. All kinds of concoctions. Manipulation. I remember back then in the materialistic gospel, a friend of mine that used to preach the materialistic gospel with me, one Saturday he just called me and say, which one should I use tomorrow? <laughs> I said, how? He said, I have run out of ideas. I've used everything I do. Please give me something because I have to raise money tomorrow. Which one should I use? I said, which ones have you used? <laughs> he gave me a long list. I said, you're all even past my own. <laughs> you are in advanced class. Me, I'm still in kindergarten. <laughs> I don't know. Use all of them together in one service. <laughs> use concoction. He said, I'm getting tired of this thing now. I can't even sleep. Because I don't know where I will start from tomorrow. I said, well, think. Because me, the one I will have suggested, you have even used all of them. So. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know which one you will use. I saw a church where they brought a door. They brought a door. Door. You know door. And kept it on the pulpit. I said, everybody that will give a thousand dollars pass through the door of prosperity. <laughs> only dummies. Only what? Only dummies will pass through that kind of door. People that they, their head is olodo, they have used religion to remove every sense of logic from their head. They are the one that will pass through that door. What is the difference between that door and the soap for prosperity? The soap that is removing suffering. The soap is even better. At least you will bath with it. <laughs> the soap is even better at least you will bet with it that door when you pass through it does not affect you in any way I don't know if I'm going to get it now they are in the same room I'm talking about Pentecostal churches and the videos are there online say so once you pass through that door you will prosper ah ah even at least the soap may have enough dark number. But that door doesn't have enough dark number. It's a new day. I said it's a new day. 
That's why John kept warning us of the doctrine of Balaam in the book of Revelation. And that means, therefore, that ministry is sacrificial living, not a paid employment. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 to 11. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 to 11, PJ. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. There are ministers you must withdraw yourself from. From such withdraw. You should not be found around them and they should not be found around you. They should not hang around you. Those who suppose that gain is godliness. Give me the next verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Next verse. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Next verse. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Next verse. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Next verse. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Next verse. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. This, this implies that every believer ought to withdraw from any minister who preaches for gain. Withdraw from any minister who preaches for gain. Don't even make them your friend. Don't watch their TV program. If by mistake you enter a place where they are playing it, ask them to put down the volume that is affecting your mental health. The word gain was translated from the Greek word prorismos, P-R-O-R-I-S-M-O-S. That's the word gain, P-R-O-R-I-S-M-O-S, which implies something used to acquire things, which can include money, cars, and houses. So proper scriptural apostolic instruction is that a minister is not to do the work of ministry for gain, for gain. This will also follow that the gospel is not to be preached for the preacher's needs to be met. You're not preaching for your needs to be met. Kenneth E. Hagin of blessed memory. Towards the end of his life did a conference. And I was privileged to listen to the full conference. It was an exclusive conference. Exclusive. With a few ministers of the gospel that are on the scene today. I won't call names. But it was exclusive. They had the meeting in an, a closed door and they recorded it. Some of the influential preachers of the gospel in America were in that meeting. In fact, one of them came late. He had to apologize. I heard his voice. Their names, all of you name. And he said to them, I sent for all of you because all of you call me father. That's why I sent for, some of, for all of you. And he said, I sent for all of you because some of you don't call me father, but at least you recognize me as your father because you teach my, my messages. He said, I call all of you because during the healing movement, during the healing movement, the healing movement, he said, I was there. It was truncated. When ministers will see the healing power of God, then they will stop halfway and raise money. The people will start getting healed. There will be an explosion of healing in the service. They will stop it. Now that people have seen the proof, then they will raise money. He said, that is what killed the healing movement. He said, I was there to witness it. And he talked about one of the, one of the patriarchs of faith who was sick then. You know, one of those names. Um, I, won't call, I don't want to call names. But one of those healing movement person, he's a big name. And he said the guy was dying. He was sick. And he went with his wife to pray for him in the hospital. And as they were climbing up the steps to go in to pray, he shook his head and turned. And he told the wife, let's go. She said, did the Lord tell you he will die? He said, I will tell you in the car. Let's go. They got in the car. He said, the Lord said, he is one of the problems to the gospel. So he's going. Before they go to him, the man died. Say the Lord say I shouldn't pray for him. Then he now told him, that thing I saw, I have seen it back in the Pentecostal charismatic movement. 
say it has come back. And then he began to talk about, you people have come up with 24-hour miracle. Seed. You have come up with seed. Giving in exchange for blessing. And then he began to talk about all the transactionary gospel. In that meeting. And these pastors had audacity to be challenging him. I listened. One of them stood up and said, yeah, uh, we, we, we agree with what you have said, uh, but don't you believe that God can move us to raise money? If God moves us to raise money, when God bless the people that obey it? And Brother Hagin said, I'm not doubting that God can move you, but don't miss what I have said. It was a sober meeting. Eight hours. I have the recordings. Then when he finished, he now asked one of his sons in ministry to put it in a book. That's the book called Midas Touch. If you read that book, it came from that meeting. Kenneth Hagin, Midas Touch. Go check it. Read it. See what I'm talking about. He said, if that materialistic transactionary gospel is not checked, that's what will kill the move of God in the coming generations. The transactionary gospel. And then he did a teaching to prove that there's nothing like give to God and be blessed in that book. And these preachers fought that book from coming to limelight. They fought the book. Let me tell you something else they did. As they left that place, they withdrew their support from his ministry. One of the things I believe that God can hegging to die at that age was heartbreak. Was heartbreak. Because he saw all his sons that will have carried the legacy of sound gospel corrupted with materialism. It broke his heart. It broke his heart. It broke his heart. Because he could see there will be no future for a ministry that has employed materialism. It has no future. It, Brother John said, the Lord said to those seven churches, if you don't repent from this man, I will take away your candle light. When the candle light of a ministry is taken, the ministry has no legacy. That ministry dies. It has no legacy. The materialistic gospel has no legacy. Because the only beneficiary is the man that is in charge. Once he dies, there's no future for that ministry. The only ministry that has a legacy is the ministry of the word of God. Preached with pure motives. Because the word is settled forever. The word is settled forever. Are we teaching here? Please, if you're hearing, say, I hear you. Yeah. Materialistic gospel. Is the greatest undoing of, of, of the work of God in our time. What about John? Look at John speaking in the same light. Third John, chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, I mean to 8. Let's go, PJ. Third John, chapter 1, verse 5 to 8. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Next verse. Which have borne witness of thy charity before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Next verse. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. They went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. Verse 8. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. In writing to Gaius, John's statement in verse 7 should be observed. Taking nothing of the Gentiles. You know what that implies? Number one. That he was speaking of ministers of the gospel who went to Gentile nations, non-Jewish territories. Number two, that Gaius was commended for his support of those ministers. Number three, that the object of their preaching was not gain. It was not for gain. Number four, that they did this to be an example to the church. That's why they did it. Number one, they went to preach to non-Gentiles. Number two, Gaius was commended for supporting those ministers. Number three, the object of their preaching was not gained. Number four, that they did this to be exemplary to the church. When God is in it, he will raise people to support it. Hello? I'm teaching here. 
When God is in it, he will raise people to support it. You don't have to manipulate people. Two days ago, I put together the budget for our love feast. Love feast is tomorrow, right? Huh? Are you expecting? Should we have love feast or we should have fasting? How many of you know that part of the church is breaking of bread? Eh? So for us to have a complete service, we must have a breaking of bread. Breaking of bread is love feast. Where we eat and fellowship and, and just demonstrate love to one another. So I was putting, Mama and I were putting the budget for the love feast of tomorrow. And it ran into some millions. And then Mama said to me, honey, how far? I said, very far. She said, this money has to come out too. I said, I don't think church has it. What do we do? She said, okay, if church don't have it, then you have to look for it. I said, okay, I'll look for it, no problem. Just keep the budget. And then I've just been talking to the Lord about it within the week. And I've been saying, Lord, that love feast has to be done. How far, Lord? Lord, I have money here. I have money there, but they are owing me here. They are owing me there. Lord, just move things. Let them pay me, and I'll just take care of this love feast without anybody knowing nothing. And that same day, I came to the office, and a brother just came from the service that night after service to my office straight. He said, Papa, the love feast on Saturday, the Lord just spoke to me. I want to pay a part of it. I want to pay part of the money. How much is it going to cost? How much? No, I didn't talk about it. I didn't mention it. But the Lord moved him. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's how it happens. And then I told him, I told him I'll, I'll ask them to give me the budget because me too, I don't even know the total budget yet because they were negotiating it with the people that were going, let me see where they arrived at. So yesterday I told him how much the budget was. He said I pay half of it. And within an hour he wired those millions, half of that budget. I told Mama quickly, deposit it with the people, let them start buying things because... There's no going back. The Lord has already shown that it shall be done. <laughs> the Lord has already shown. The Lord has already shown that it shall be done. When they have paid 50% of the money, what is remaining? It's is as good as done. God has mobilized the job. That's how it happens. When we got TVC, TVC, we got, I just felt like there, it was time for us to put the gospel on TVC. And I prayed about it. And I had strong conviction. I told Pastor Gospel. And I said, you guys, work out the details and get back to me. He got Pastor Funshaw. They worked out the details. They said, this is what it will cost every three months. And I looked. I called the American team. I said, you guys, do you have some money for us? We want to get this thing going. And the American team said, yes, we have that kind of money. I said, send it, send it, send it quickly. They wired it. First three months. Second three months. The thing is going seamlessly. Seamlessly. No tension. Because God is in it. We got Pop Central. Pastor Gospel emailed me a deal from Pop Central on DSTV, which was going to get millions of people to see what is going on in 30 Days of Glory. 30 Days Project. And I said to Pastor Gospel, let me pray about it. But this deal is a very, very good deal. Very good deal. I said, but can we talk to the person and see if we can negotiate it down? Pastor Gospel say, Papa, you will talk. Because me, I have negotiated my own to this point. I say, put the person online. We went online and we discovered the person is in the church of one of my spiritual sons. And then she says, well, you know, I attend this church. I say, and then Pastor Gospel that's Papa's son. She said, yes. And that's why I'm willing to do anything to make sure the program comes live on the channel. So I said, bring it down. Bring it down to this amount. She said, okay. She said, I'll do something about it. And she brought it down further. And the deal was good. And then the money just came for us to pay for it. And we paid for it before we started. We paid for it before we started. In Cameroon, I think I'm on TV two hours every day. Two hours in Cameroon, right? The brethren in Cameroon came together, raised the money, and paid for it. It's running without me thinking. In, in Tanzania, I'm on radio four hours every Sunday. They paid for it without me knowing. All they asked me for is materials. In different nations of the earth, radio stations, even in Nigeria here, in Uganda, right? I'm on radio, right? In Uganda. Yeah, I'm not even aware of where I am on radio. Eh? 
In Makodi, I'm already all right. Every Sunday. And the materials are coming. It's my, they are the ones. It's office and them that are doing the thing now. So I don't even know where we have radio broadcasts. It's just happening all over the place. You know why? When you are after God's heart, God will be in the hearts of men to make it work. There will be no manipulation. It will be a work of the spirit. There's no way you see what God is doing with us. You think somebody is manipulating. How many people can you manipulate like this? This must be the spirit of God. And it's just the beginning, no? It's just the beginning. It's just the beginning. God is raising men. Even amongst us here. And money is coming like I've never seen it before. <laughs> money is coming, no? God is raising men. Money is coming. Mon hey, money is coming. Did you hear that announcement? For the mission. Money is coming. Kabayada. And there are some of you here, your hearts are burning with a passion. Therefore, your hands will grab this money. We will take this gospel to everywhere, even where people are not. We will enter there with the gospel. Everywhere. Everywhere. Bedroom, car, everywhere. Even in the farm, the thing will get there. Because this gospel shall be preached unto all nations. Christ died for everybody. So we must get the word to everybody. Somebody shout, I hear you. Please, you can be seated. Let me round off this class. Now look at brother Paul's second letter in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 8. Please pay attention here. See something else brother Paul deals with here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 8. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. 9. And when I was present with you and wanted I was chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. I've kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. So will I keep myself. I've kept myself. From being burdensome. What did Paul mean? Note what is the fact that Paul has spoken concerning the selfishness of the Macedonian church in giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9. Though they had a great trial of affliction in their finances. But Paul said that affliction was not enough reason for them to be selfless. I mean was, was not enough to stop them from being selfless. They were going through things, but they were still selfless. They gave and gave, even in the depth of poverty. Their generosity. And he captured when he wrote to the church at Philippi, which was in the regions of Macedonia. Look at Philippians 4.15. Philippians chapter 4 verse 15. Philippians 4.15. PJ. Philippians 4.15. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving but ye only. This relates with an historical fa fact which was found in Acts 17 13 to 15. That historical fact that Paul was relating with here is in Acts 17 13 to 15 where he said but when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea. They came thither also and stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go as it were to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens. And receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. So this is what he meant when he said, when I left. This was the trip he was referring to. This was when he left for Corinth in Acts 18. Paul went to Corinth where he met Priscilla and Aquila. So it was that after that he now said, I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man. 
For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you, and so will I keep myself. The term, I robbed other churches, is an English term which implies he took from other churches. That is, when he left Macedonia, where Philippi was, no church communicated with him like they did. More so, when these comments were made concerning the church at Philippi, Paul was in prison. And this accounts for why he comment, commended them. They ministered to my needs. Therefore, we can say that what Paul meant was that what he gave the church at Corinth was a product of what the church at Macedonia gave him. So Macedonia gave him, he gave it to the church in Corinth. Just to show that he was not relying on what they were given to live. He took time to clarify things. More so, he now said they ministered to his need. This is very intriguing because Corinth was historically a commercial city where a lot of resources exchange hands. However, the church at Corinth did not seem to exemplify much generosity. Let's examine Paul's reference on how he lived around the churches. Let's see how Paul lived around those churches. Am I helping somebody here? 1 Thessalonians 2.9, PJ. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we, could not, we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. We labor night and day, but we will not be chargeable to any of you. We preach unto you the gospel free. We will not be chargeable. Now, look at 2 Thessalonians 3.8. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 8. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. We labor, we travel night and day, but we don't want to be chargeable to any of you. So we minister to you free of charge. Free of charge. We don't want to take anything from you. That's ministry. That's ministry. Not asking to send bank account. How much is the honorarium? Make sure you have five star hotel, presidential suite. <laughs> How many cars are you bringing to the airport? First class for five of us, economy for five. I'm coming with my intercessors. Are there no intercessors in that church? Ministerial malpractice. Privilege abuse. I go to churches and they bring, they bring, a, um, they bring a protocol. Protocol to my hotel. And they say, Papa, these five people will be here. They are stationed to be here for you. I say, for what? <laughs> for what? Who will come? And steal me here. I mean, a hotel. They didn't steal unbelievers. It's me they will steal. Okay, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the protocol. One, two, three, five. Go home. Go home. Say, no. I say, I, I command you <laughs> in the name of Jesus. Go home. Since I'm speaking gently, you don't want to go. What time is the service? Five. Come back 15 minutes to five. Go and enjoy your lives. Why should I punish you here the whole day? Waste your day, waste your energy. For what? Go home and rest. Me, I'm going to the bed, I'm going to sleep. When I'm tired, I pray. When I pray, I study. When I study, I eat. When I eat, I relax. If I don't have what to do, I watch television. I'm not going out of my room. Oh. I don't go out when I'm preaching. I stay in my room. Sometimes I don't even know the city I went to till I leave. I go to. Most of you here know what I'm talking about. For what now? It's only somebody that's moving around that they will carry. I'm inside room. I'm not going anywhere. 
it will be difficult to carry me. Because you won't see me. Even in this Uyo, you can hardly see me. Ask them. Eh? You can hardly see me in town. For what? I'm in my house day to night. If you see me come out, it's service. If I leave service, it's house. If I leave my house, it's airport. You won't find me in... For what now? I am not the surveyor. The master planner of Uyo. No, you can't find me. You won't see me in town. Sometimes I don't know what is happening in Uyo for one month. I don't know what town looks like. It's my house. Dr. Gabe, you know now. All of you know. Every time, if I'm not in my house, I'm on the pulpit. If I'm not on the pulpit, I have traveled. You can never find me in town. Doing what? Doing what? Except I'm going to go and collect money. <laughs> and if it's for money, I will know what time my money is ready. I will arrive and collect. And most monies are transferred. Yeah. So what am I going for? If it's a business meeting, we do it in an exclusive place. Once the meeting is over, bam! And I don't even do business meetings in New York because most of my businesses are not in you anyway. So why will you find me? Why will you find me? It's a preacher that moves around. That carries stories around. And then they carry story and follow. When I, when, I, when I was a young guy in ministry, one night, I went to look for bread. <laughs> Hunger was disturbing mama and I and the children. So mama said, look for bread. Around 11 o'clock. So we drove. We drove, drove, drove. Then we used to live by, with Pastor Dan down at the building Sukara. So I drove. I went and parked my car by that roundabout up there. I didn't know that where I parked my car, was nightclub. <laughs> I didn't know. So I parked the car and I went around looking for any shop that is open at that time to buy bread. By the next day, news has entered town that they saw me in nightclub. <laughs> nightclub where? Say his car was parked. If he's in this social media age, they will have snapped it and put on Facebook. The man of God. Boogieing in nightclub. <laughs> After that night, I said, ah, ah, Can you imagine? Next time we have to look well before we park. <laughs> you won't find me. Why will you punish protocol? Keep them in the hotel. Keep them in the hotel. I remember when we used to preach the materialistic gospel because it was about showmanship. How many of you know the materialistic gospel is about showmanship? You line up escort car, you line up pilot car, two, three cars, two, three cars, you are in the middle. And then sometimes the protocol will have to come out and be running with their legs. And be running with their legs. And you are inside the car. And these are brethren in Christ. These are sons of God. See how they are running and they can even fall. And then you come out of the car. Like a superstar. We'll bring out one leg first. You know, a, you, they have to learn it. You bring out one leg first. You stretch your head. Then the photographer will snap it. So that they see the kind of car you're coming out from. Then you come down. Then they snap another one. They see the line of cars you are standing by. Then you take another step. And you put the legs in a way where the shoes can be captured. Because the shoe is part of the ministry. It's a total showmanship. That useless, useless, smelling gospel called prosperity gospel. Showmanship. Oppressive. And fraudulent. Somebody had me preach. He said, Abel is just angry. No, I'm not angry. I'm not angry. I'm not an angry man. I'm not angry. I'm just displeased with the disservice that has been done to people's lives. You heard a gentleman last night. He said, I didn't want to go to church. Because every time I went, they asked me to sow. I sow till they say the thing that is most painful. I dropped my laptop. He said, God will restore. I didn't see another one. I said, this is Yahoo, Yahoo. 
So I stayed away from church. Because there was no need. Why, why would I be going to a place uh, where it's like MMM? In fact, MMM, at least you will cash one or two times before the other one will disappear. This one, you cash nothing. <laughs> you will cash once or twice. And if you are early in MMM, you will keep cashing. You never got yours. <laughs> we didn't know you did. <laughs> Cash once or twice. I know somebody whom everybody was cashing, everybody was cashing. He went and withdrew all his money as he put it. <laughs> High blood pressure. He could not be comforted. He could not be comforted. He cried the cry of life. <laughs> That's what the materialistic gospel is like. Promising people what Jesus never promised them. That's a fraud there. Are we here? If I'm communicating, can I have a good amen? amen. No way, you know, brother, brother Paul in teaching this, he says, Neither do you eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travel night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. And this no way pretends that Paul lived off churches for the supply of his needs. It should be recalled that he walked as to be exemplary, not to be chargeable. And this is further strengthened by what Brother Paul said later on. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. Oh, I love this one. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. The children ought not to lay up for the parents but the parents for the children. Eh? Father for sale. I seek not yours, but you. You are the one I want, not what you have. That's genuine ministry. I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to live for the fathers, but the fathers ought to live for the children. He bought up, further buttresses what he has been saying all the while to all the churches. Brother Paul. Well, of course, you know, he chose not to be a burdensome to the people. He was a tent maker and it implied how he laid up. If he had relied on the giving of the churches for his sustenance, it would have been contradictory in all his epistles. He never. Does he mean that when they gave him, he didn't receive? He received as honor. He received it. But he was not demanding it. Do you understand? He was not demanding it. Now let me tell you something else. When a ministry genuinely touches you, there's nothing you will not give it. It's just natural. You are so grateful that you are looking for what can I do to support this work. <laughs> the last time I went to London to Pastor Fola, Pastor Fola set me up, man. Set me up. Set me up. He knows my brand of hotels. He knows my brand of hotels where I like to stay. He took me to one hotel where I stood, I said, Father Lord, wonderful, this is London. Beautiful, I mean, beautiful. I wasn't expecting it. I was shocked myself. Very beautiful. And I'm grateful. When I came back from the trip, my girls saw it. They said, God forbid. Daddy, so you went there before us. <laughs> that was our dream hotel in London. And we were prayerfully thinking of how we will convince you to take us there. Now you went there and enjoy everything without us. Daddy, you're a betrayer. <laughs> I said, it's not me, it's Pastor Fala. Me, I wasn't expecting it. It's Pastor Fala that took me there. I wasn't expecting it. 
if I'd got into London and he kept me in Ibis, there's a hotel in London called Ibis Hotel. It's a budget hotel. I would have slept there comfortably and preach well. But they decided that they value me more than that. And they have the resources. So they honored me. And let me, I won't lie to you, it made me preach better. <laughs> no, God is my, why will I lie now? What is there to lie for? I wasn't tired. I preached for how many hours? Five hours. Because once I entered the hotel environment, my body is refreshed within one hour. The atmosphere, the air, everything just, I ash. You lie down within one hour, you have recovered. You stand up and study. Now, that's not to say that if I lie on the floor, I will not, you know me, I'm not economical. Even if it's two people, if I preach, you would think it's a crowd. I don't have a problem because my loyalty is to the one who sent me. But the point I'm making is that doesn't mean that sons will not honor fathers. But the point here is motive. The fathers must not have a motive of how to collect, how to collect, how to collect anyhow. No, no, no. The fathers must realize that what is more important to us is you, not what you have. You are the one we want. Because if you do well, the gospel will continue to advance. If you don't do well, even if you give us money, it's useless. That's what brought Paul is emphasizing. That's what brother Paul is emphasizing. You honor your man of God. We've been dealing with the honor system since yesterday, right? And you can see it all over the scripture, right? But the motive of a man doing ministry must not be to wait for people to take care of you. Even though they will take care of you, but in case they don't take care of you, you're not disappointed. Are we communicating here? Yes. We went to Cameroon. Huh? <laughs> we were in Ghana to preach. And as we were finished, we were going to go to Cameroon. So we checked our monies that we had. We couldn't afford the tickets to go to Cameroon. But there was need for three of us, four of us to go with Matthew, myself, because Cameroon was a fresh ground and we were just breaking it. And I needed all their support so we can go in as a, as a force and just help Cameroon. But we didn't have the money. So I called Pastor Philemon from Ghana and Dr. Gabriel. I said, guys, Matthew is going from Nigeria. We will land Abuja. I will join Matthew. We will fly. Matthew has been able to raise money for his ticket. And I have my own ticket. But two of you, I don't have ticket. But you must be in Cameroon. So, Pastor Philemon said, how do we do it? I said, anyhow, you must be in Cameroon because I need two of you there. But the money we have can only buy my ticket and Matthew has bought his ticket. So, I'm, I'll meet him in Abuja to fly. Then I said to Pastor Philemon and Dr. Gabriel, there is road to Cameroon. It's like seven hours from Ecom. So I will, I will organize for you people to have money to rent a car so you're comfortable to take you straight to Cameroon to meet us. It's okay, no problem. So we landed. They came to Uyo on their own, two of them. They now said, they called me and said, we have decided to go by sea. I say, why sea? Philemon convinced me, Pastor Philemon. He says, sea is three hours. Why should we be on the road for seven, eight hours? And we're not even going to the venue. We're first of all going to land in another place before we continue the journey. When we can, in three hours, arrive. I say, that is a good idea. But two of you cannot swim. They said, no, 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 no. They say it's safe. We just go behind Uyo here, enter, and in three hours we're in Cameroon. It made sense. I said, that means you will even arrive before us. Because my flight to Cameroon is a whole day. 
Because there's no direct flight. You fly to Togo, you wait. You wait for hours. Then now you connect from Togo to, 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 to Douala or any of those places. And by the time you're arriving, it's towards evening. So a whole day is finished. But three hours, you'll be there early enough. So, <laughs> two of us got to Cameroon and were waiting for Pastor Philemon and Dr. Gabriel. I called, they said they have left. Four hours, five hours. Pastor Matthew comes to my room in the hotel. Babana, Babana, their phones are not going. I said, no, it's not true. He said, their phone. I carried my phone. I called Pastor Philemon. I said, in the name of Jesus, go through. He didn't go through. Ah. I called Uyo. They said they have left. I said somebody to where they left. They said the thing left since. Ah. Three hours. I locked the door. They got to bandala to Pastor Matthew is praying. I'm praying. After a while, I called Pastor Philemon. He didn't go through. I said, Father, now this is from morning. This is around three o'clock. I said, No, Lord, it can never be said. Your investment on this man cannot be wasted. It takes time to raise one man of God. We have two. No ways. Around four o'clock, I reached Pastor Philemon. Where are you? He said, we are just in one forest. <laughs> you are going by sea. How did you enter forest? <laughs> sea and forest. What's the connection? I don't know. What's the connection? Please help me. Is there a connection? Sea and forest. So, <laughs> I said, what are you doing inside forest? He said the storm was too much. So they diverted us to the forest. He said, but we're coming. I said, Father. So at least I know they are alive. So now we went to service. I could preach well because my men are on their way. Finally, they arrived in the night. I think 10 or 11. Eh? 10, around 10. Like pillars of salt. <laughs> the salt that Dr. Gabriel and Pastor Philemon brought to Cameroon, we could have started a business. <laughs> because even after they showered, by the next day, if you touch them, salt was they come. <laughs> salt was still coming out. So I went to Pastor Philemon and said, But I told you to come by road. He said, but they say sea was better. I said, but see the sea now. <laughs> I am still trying to console them. Pastor Matthew has already entered coordinators. All our coordinators. We are raising money for ticket. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. We need money for ticket. We cannot lose our men of God. We are not going to UC. We are flying back. Within a few minutes, our coordinators have raised money for those two tickets. And we flew back. But the point I'm making is, you can see the level of sacrifice that is in our heart for the gospel that we preach. That's the point. I could have raised the money for those tickets, but we just didn't want to be bought in some. We didn't want to be bought in some. When you hear Paul say, in shipwreck, often, not once, often. So in brother, Dr. Gabriel's CV now, he will put in shipwreck once. <laughs> Apostolic affiliation. affiliations. <laughs> Pastor Philemon will say, in this journey of the ministry and in this journey of the gospel, we've been through many things. Uh. We've been through many things uh, from trials and tribulations and temptation. In shipwreck once. <laughs> <laughs> Glory! <laughs> they are called the travels of a man of God. So that's what makes the ministry exciting. We go through things and it becomes a story tomorrow. 
God comforts us so we can comfort others with that comfort that he comforted us. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. So brother Paul did not rely on the givings of the churches primarily for his sustenance. Conclusively, 2 Corinthians 2.11. 2 Corinthians 2.11-13. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Sorry, 12, 11. Because that didn't sound like it. First, Second Corinthians 12, 11. I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Next verse. Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Next verse. For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Forgive me this wrong. So Paul now is rebuking the church at Corinth for taking advantage of his sacrificial living not to honor his ministry. He says, so because I didn't want to be burdensome to you, you didn't even honor our labor. He said, please, forgive me this wrong. It's wrong. You ought to be able to know that even if we don't demand anything of you, if you've been blessed by this ministry, it is just natural for you to support the cause. Paul said it's wrong for you to be blessed by a ministry and you don't grow to a point of being responsible. He had to fix it. He said, forgive me this wrong. He is it is of his own volition that he chose not to be chargeable. He mentioned that it was for him not to be burdensome to them. This was his intention. Not for material gain, but to be a blessing. But you must remember, no man goes to war at his own charge. Right? Hello? A laborer is worthy of his wages. A man comes to bless you, minister to you. It is not out of character for you to honor him. He's not going to charge you, but it's your responsibility to honor him. And when you honor him, he receives the honor without grudging it. That's what you have. That's what's available. If it's plenty, praise God. If it's not plenty, praise God. If it's small, praise God. If it's big, praise God. Whichever way. But there has to be honor expressed. Are we communicating here? There has to be honor expressed. And I think this morning we talked about culture of giving, right? Yeah. Brother Paul will say to that church in, you know, um, in that 2 Corinthians 12, 14, as a round of this class. Are you blessed this morning? 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. PJ, let's go. Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. Yes. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Next verse. And I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. Though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. 16. But be it so, I did not burden you. Nevertheless, being crafty, I caught you with guile. 17. Did I make a gain of you by any of them whom I sent unto you? 18. I desired Titus, and with him I sent a brother. Did Titus make a gain of you? Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? 19. Again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you. We speak before God in Christ, but we do all things dearly beloved for your edifying. 20. For I fear lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I shall be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbitings, whisperings, swellings, tumults. 21. And lest when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall bewail many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. So conclusively on full-time ministry, is everything clear on full-time ministry now? Everybody understands what it is, right? So conclusively, full-time ministry is tautology and cannot be substantiated as a doctrine of the church. Rather, what is seen is the fact that the work of ministry is full-time based on the believer's dedication to service. The work of ministry is full-time. That word, ministry in itself, is full-time because ministry means dedication to service. And in giving to ministers, the focus of this is without regard to the fact that they have an occupation. 
ministers should be gainfully employed. But as a mark of honor to them in fulfilling of their roles, in laboring and in teaching the flock, we support them. We honor them. So for the believer that is matured and walking in obedience to scriptures, he now gives to the work and supports the minister who labors over him as a responsibility. Because he's now matured. So that term, full-time ministry, best relates with a full-time or consistency and dedication in the ministry of teaching and training believers for the work of ministry. The work, the term full-time ministry relates with a full-time or consistency and dedication in the ministry, in teaching and training believers for the work of ministry. Glory to God. So discipleship is our call in the church. That's our call. Discipleship is our call. That's our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is how we become part of Christ in the building of his church. We raise disciples. We equip them. We empower them. And then we release them to do ministry. We raise them, we empower them, we release them to do ministry. In Power City, you all know, crowd is not our focus. Crowd is not our focus. Our focus is laborers, raising men, raising men. Eventually, the crowd will come. Because when you have raised men everywhere, that's how the crowd comes. But by the time you look at the kind of men that are raised, they will all be quality men and women of God. Which makes the work of God fast. Instead of just packing crowd everywhere and gathering them. Breakfast service, lunch on service, suya night, balangu night. <laughs> eh? Eat after every service. Just to keep people. And anywhere there's food, crowd will gather. True or false? Free transportation, free food. You have a complete church. But the problem is, when you are preaching, they are sleeping. Because they didn't come for the preaching. They came for free transport and they came for food. Finish that your nonsense and give us food. You're wasting our time. But when people come for the world, when they come for the world, they may be five or six or ten when they come for the word. When they now get the word and grow, those are ten pastors. Kayatamash. Glory to God. So a minister of the gospel must be patient in raising men. Don't be in a hurry. We are not in a competition. Don't be in a hurry. Take your time. Raise them well. And when you have raised them, the work will move with speed. Once you have raised them, the, the speed will come. Once you have raised them, the, the major work is in raising them. But once you have raised laborers, the speed will come. The speed will come. You can start church anywhere because there are laborers to get the work going. That's what matters. Raise men. Jesus spent three and a half years raising 12. Three and a half years. But when he left, this 12 has kept the legacy of the gospel till today. Are we together here? Yeah, so raise them. Build them. Don't blame them if you don't teach them. Don't blame them if you don't teach them. And in Power City, God is raising people all over the world. I'm so excited. A lot of training is ongoing. Coordinators are being trained continually. Disciples are being raised all over the place. Campuses are being launched everywhere. Right now, I'm sure there's a whole lot of training going on for new campus coordinators to start campuses everywhere. And in Power City, after you've stayed for a short while and you understand and you mature, then you should start a campus. 
I said it the other day. Don't be in power city forever without pastoring. Then you didn't understand anything we taught. You're not growing. The fruit of ministry is ministry. You are trained so you can in turn do ministry. And what Jesus will reward you for is for ministry and service. That's what Jesus will reward for. There's no reward for church attendance. There's reward for ministry. So every man a minister. Glory to God. Are we blessed this morning? Let's stand on your feet. That's all I got for us in this service. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't your neighbor say, man of God. We have no excuse. We do this work. We make money. We do ministry. We are full-time ministers. A full-time minister is not one who went to Bible school. A full-time minister is one that is dedicated to raising disciples. Is it clear here? Amen. Amen. There are some of you in Power City by now. If it's before, I will have given all of you bishopric regalia. By now, you will have all been bishops. Because the work some of you are doing, even bishops I know are not doing half of it. I know what I'm talking about. Some of you will have been wearing that thing by now. With somebody carrying knife and following you behind. <laughs> Sintos, muntos, kuntos. <laughs> or some of you will have been wearing this thing. Kasok. Uh, Kasok. Dog chain. Eh? <laughs> but that is no ministry. That's no ministry. That's just ceremonial appearance. That's no ministry. Somebody can wear all of that and it's not born again. Because those things are sold in the market. So anybody can buy it. But the real deal is the labor in word, labor in ministry, labor in raising men. Glory to God. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you are in full-time ministry. You are a full-time minister. And we are committed to this. Say, neighbor, I must do ministry. Or I must do ministry. Or I must do ministry. Or I must do ministry. Ministry is my life. I live my life doing ministry. Glory to God. Glory to God. I want us to pray for one another that each one of us will continue to find fulfillment and satisfaction in serving God's purpose. Let's pray for one another. Begin to continue to find fulfillment and satisfaction in serving God's purpose, in serving the kingdom of God, in serving the will of God, in serving the brethren, in serving the people of God, that we continue to derive fulfillment and satisfaction. Kipala katobinga egerete singala na mota maloje kele de borosa kalana agarato sekerida garanto kelina mama maya na gaga we walk worthy of the lord unto all pleasing we walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. We are fruitful unto every good work. Lego subra natenga, lego roto sika lada baba, le katombe, le garoto sika baraka tona gaga. Pray for your neighbor, strengthen with might. That your neighbor is strengthened with might by the spirit in the inner man. Strengthen with might by the spirit in the inner man. Strengthen with might by the spirit in the inner man. Christ dwells in your heart by faith. You're rooted, you're grounded in love. Egebo Santengala, Agarato Sekebara, Ageshonda, 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 Ageshonda. Strengthen with mind. 
Pray for your neighbor. He will run and not be weary. He will walk and not faint. Kept by the power of God. Preserved by the spirit of Christ. No discouragement. No distraction. You are unmovable. You're always abounding in the work of the Lord. Your labor is not in vain things. Agarato sebrina gande. Egeleba shonta. Egeleto sima nakatole. Agarato mbela. Agebo jekelele bosa. Let's pray for one another one more minute. Fired up. The zeal of God consume us. We advance his cause. We advance his will on the earth. Lego sumbra nagagalarabaya. Pray for your neighbor that he's a city taker. He is a groundbreaker for the gospel. You take your city. You are a line crosser. Lega sombre de gegaya. Ege badombe. Ege leba shontalara baba. Angele rebo sataya. You break through frontiers. Aga basontele. Ege reto sobayanash. thank you father thank you father i like you to lay hands on yourself and begin to pray over yourself pray over yourself speak over your life speak over yourself i am committed to the cause i am committed to the assignment I am committed to the will of God. I live the will of God all my days. I am committed to God's purpose. I walk in the light. I have no occasion of stumbling. I stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. I stand perfect and complete in all of the will of God. My heart and my motives are pure before the Lord. My heart and my motives are pure before the Lord. My intentions they are pure before the Lord. I serve Jesus with my spirit in the gospel of his son Pray for yourself. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm well. I'm strong. I'm healthy. I'm well. I'm refreshed by the will of God. I am filled with joy. I am filled with joy. Because I am in the center of the will of God. I am filled with joy. Because I am in the center of the will of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Glory to God. Lift your hands and just give him praise and thanksgiving for answered prayer. Praise him and thank him for answered prayer this morning. Praise him and thank him for answered prayer this morning. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. You go from strength to strength. You go from grace to grace. You are kept by the power of God. You will walk and not be weary. You will run and not faint. The youth will faint and utterly fall. But because you wait on the Lord continually, you have renewed strength. You have renewed strength. You have renewed strength. Have renewed strength. Your heart is pure. Your motives are pure. And in the name of Jesus, you will not walk with the foolish. You will not walk with the foolish. In the name of Jesus, you are kept from wrong influences. You are kept from wrong influences. You are kept from corruption. You are born of the incorruptible seed. You will not be corrupted. You are born of the incorruptible seed. In ministry, you will not be corrupted. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, we pray. And everyone says a powerful amen. amen. Can we give the Lord a praise? Amen. Glory! 
Aleluia. Uh, Amen. Are we blessed this morning? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. I love you too. I'm going to let you go so you can eat some food and catch a bit of rest before the four o'clock meeting. You know, this is homecoming, man. Before the four o'clock meeting. You know, Kenneth Hagin used to have three sessions. Three sessions in their camp meeting. They have morning, they have afternoon, they have evening. When they come for camp meeting, one week. Morning, afternoon, evening. We're getting there gradually. We're getting there gradually. Yeah, because that's the whole reason for coming. You know, that's the whole reason. As God begins to give us money, a time will come when we come for that one week. We'll just be here. We take a break. We all eat. We come back. We continue. We take a break. We eat again. We come back. We continue. Then when we close, you go and rest. Tomorrow you are back. We do all the eating here. We do everything here. It will happen. It will happen. We hire people to do the cooking. They just be cooking. Tibalabas. Yes. Just be cooking, that's their work. As they are cooking, there's TV and everything where they are cooking. So they are hearing what we are doing. When we take break like this now, we go to the cafeteria. All of us move in there. We eat. After we eat, we come back. We sing a bit. <clears throat> Next session. Morning till night. By the time you go back home, you just be exploding effortlessly. We're getting there. Glory to God. So go and catch a break and then eat something and we see you at 4 o'clock. Amen. Today is the last day of a weekday. Tomorrow is just prayer cruise in the morning and our love feast. And then Sunday is impartation service. Yes. And all admin pastors, please stay back with me for another 5 minutes, 10 minutes. But everybody else have a great afternoon. God's grace. Greet somebody. Make somebody happy. We'll see you at 4 p.m. Great grace. Hello, Jemima Damina here, and it is Homecoming 2024. And to those of you who are not able to join us physically, don't worry, you're not left out. The services will be streamed every evening, 6 p.m. GMT plus one on all social platforms. And on the last day, 4th of August, at 8 a.m. GMT plus one and 11 a.m. GMT plus one. And this year's homecoming is going to be an amazing time of fellowship, an amazing time of unlearning and relearning. Trust me, it's not something you want to miss. So join us as we learn about who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and what Christ can do through us. And until I come your way again tomorrow, don't you ever forget that the kingdom of God is in power. Amen. We trust that you have been blessed by this message. To order the complete series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.